All right, so um, get started here. Um, thank you all for uh, joining us today. Um, this is uh, Filtration Fundamentals, a webinar on uh, pre-bottling best practices um, uh, featuring Maria Peterson, a filtration specialist with Scott Laboratories. Just a few housekeeping items as we get started. Um, this session is being recorded um, and it will be posted to VT Analogy's um, blog as an industry resource uh, shortly, uh, probably within a few days of, uh, of this event. So you can access it at a later time too if you wanna refresh uh, your memory on any, on any points or share it with others within your team. Um, second item is that, you know, this is set up as a meeting. Um, so everybody does have the ability to unmute themselves. Um, we uh, welcome you to unmute and um, ask your questions verbally during the Q&A session, but we just ask, obviously, that you remain muted until that um, point, just to have less background noise. Um, a survey will be sent out immediately following this event, um, and it's really awesome if you could fill it out. It's really short. It's like 10 questions. Um, they estimate about two to maybe five minutes, depending on how much stuff you, you want to uh, pass on. Um, and it allows us to uh, record our impacts back to our institutions. Um, and it also more importantly allows us to gauge um, interest in future, future programming related to uh, filtration and bottling. Um, and then finally, um, as we get started, I wanted to thank two people. First of all, uh, Megan Hereford, who's um, on the call with us today. Many of you I'm sure know Megan. She is the sales representative for uh, Scott labs for our region. Um, and Megan has uh, just been wonderful at um, helping me to start to get to know the industry um, when, I, when I was starting, and also facilitating these introductions between me and Maria so that uh, we could uh, provide this programming today. And then I also wanted to thank uh, Maria for kindly <laughs> agreeing to do um, this event with us today. She's super busy. She's the filtration specialist for all of uh, North America for Scott Labs. Um, she originally hails from South Africa, where she earned her enology and viticulture degree from the University of Stellenbosch in 2000. Um, and since then, she's gained valuable winemaking and grape growing experience as, uh, from working all over the world and making, uh, uh, along with making all the mistakes a winemaker is especially expected to make, especially in filtration. She joined Scott Labs in 2013 and enjoys the challenge of solving filtration issues and re recommending more effective and efficient ways for wine and other precious liquids to make the successful journey to clarity and stability. So with that, uh, I welcome Maria and uh, mm -hmm. take it away. Thank you so much, Beth, for the opportunity and for putting this together. It's it's very uh, powerful stuff um, and filtration. And I say this every time and I will say it every time. It is designed to make you feel insecure. If you're not feeling insecure or you're not, you feel like you're just not very good at it, this is completely normal. So give yourself a pat on the back for being here because it is awkward and it's supposed to be that way. If it's not awkward, then maybe there is a little psychological problem going on, but <laughs> We're all a little bit psychological in this industry. So I'm going to dive right in. Um, what we're going to discuss here, let me see. Of course, now the pointer wants to be funny, right? Okay. We're going to talk about this little setup here on the right. There's not a lot of pictures in this uh, uh, presentation, just because it's the nitty gritty and I, you can't always color it the way that you think it is. It is very gray area, but what we're gonna try and focus on is um, sterile filtration principles and practices. We're gonna go through QC checks before, during, and after sterile filtration. We're gonna touch on turbidity versus filtrability and how to measure them if that's something that you would like to do. Uh, the timing of additions before bottling and how that affects filtrability options for adjusting filtrability in line with bottling, and then membrane storage and mem management and general bot bottling line sanitation guidelines. That last one is a whole other presentation, so I'm not going to go too deep into that, but I, like I keep on alluding to, you will see that um, this is broad strokes. It is a complex uh, range of 
issues and it is something that we need to hear over and over it's not a it's not a oh you learned it once and now you just it's the information has been downloaded into your brain and you'll never make a mistake again it's not like that it's it's ever changing so let's talk about that little filter and um, which you saw here this is a setup that's normally used you have a pre-filter cartridge for your water this is the water that's being rinsed that, that that you're going to use for rinsing so that it's clean and it's good and it's not going to clog up your membranes prematurely then normally we have a pre-filter cartridge housing and a final filter cartridge housing so i'll keep on referring to this uh now and then but so when we talk about you know filter cartridges used for bottling you need to make sure that these are food and beverage grade uh, you know if you have a good supplier uh, chances are that they would not sell you an industrial filter and I just bring that up because some filters are used in the motor oil industry they do not use solvents like alcohol so make sure this is something that you would want to drink and that you know these wines are something you work really hard at why would you introduce them to the dark side food and beverage grade friendly grade <laughs> um, then you want to make sure that um, you know the retention rating I'm not talking about the porosity I'm talking about the validation uh, was there a challenge test for these cartridges so the magic number is 10 to the power of 7 per centimeter squared or 10 to the power of 9 per 10 inch some manufacturers use one or the other and then you know ask for the validation paperwork to prove the above and that that it's not just the oh it's more or less 92 uh, percent get that paperwork so that you know what you have um, and then because if you look at validation paperwork it's boring as hell to go through all that stuff but the the manufacturers that use them they, they do a lot of work and it's very interesting how they actually do it some microorganisms are smaller than others so some uh, you know some uh, porosities they challenge with the smaller uh, microorganism than the other so Really what I'm trying to say is go for the ultra premium quality because you really get what you pay for. This is one of those steps that you can't skimp on. And if you buy an ultra premium quality, chances are your throughput's gonna be fantastic. If you, you know, if you do all the other things that we were gonna go through. Um, but the, the biggest thing is if you have an ultra quality premium, premium quality cartridge your throughput's going to be fantastic and then if you go and calculate the dollar that you spent on media and the throughput that you got that's how you do it if you buy an inexpensive cartridge and you throw it out every time um, and you don't quite get that throughput then that goes into your calculation as well but we definitely see that it makes a lot of sense to get one where the pleating te technology has been done right. There's, there's quite a lot of things to go into. So I'm gonna make myself move on. Um, it's useful to buy from a vendor that can support you so that when you call them and ask them what the hell happened, they can kind of help you troubleshoot and uh, help you improve your processes. Uh, it's, it's useful and uh, it's, there is no terrible question to ask. I might laugh at you silently, but I won't tell you that it was a terrible question. <laughs> so there is that. Um, when properly used, a membrane should last for a long time, high volume. Uh, for a sweet wine uh, that's properly pre-filtered, 30,000 gallons per 30 inch is normal. For dry wines that are colloidally and dramatic, upwards of 100,000 gallons per 30 inch. Uh, if you, of course, if you overwhelm your membrane, even the best one won't be able to retain all the microorganisms. So we're going to go into a little bit of prefiltration uh, steps. But here, see pretty pictures. I did do some pretty pictures just to show you that final filter looks something like this. It comes, you know, here you have the prefilter cartridge and then the final filter cartridge in a single 30 inch code seven. Uh, here I show you just the bottom of a three round cartridge housing because it's not everybody needs that kind of capacity, but you see this plate fits on top of this plate. So the wine comes in through here. Then the cartridges are installed in these three places. Then it goes through them and it goes out through the middle. If you, for example, 
didn't need all of the positions. You really just need one or two cartridges, but you might grow into a three round eventually. You can use one of these code seven plugs to plug a position or two uh, in that housing and grow into it. So just to show you, uh, you know, you get these housings all the way to 24 round. There are uh, wineries that have 30 or 48 round cartridge housings, which are quite interesting uh, to have to set up. And then here, you know, you have different medias on the market. There's polyether cell phone, there's PVDF, uh, there is uh, glass fiber, cellulose acetate. Here are some different cool pictures of them. This is polyether cell phone, this is uh, glass fiber, this is cellulose acetate. And then this is a nice micro uh, photo of what that surface of that membrane actually looks like, and this is what it's retaining, enococcus bacteria in this case. Um, so if you look at this one, and then you look at this one, you see that that membrane doesn't have a lot of dirt holding capacity, right? So I'm going to say that word a lot during this presentation. Um, you want depth, you want dirt holding capacity. Uh, and then I just thought I'd put in here the average flow rate on a bottling line for a 0.45 micron membrane is, you know, around five gallons per minute per 10 inch segment. So if you need to bottle faster than 15 gallons per minute, or you have bigger ranges that you need to bottle, then you need to look at a multiple round housing um, for improved speed and capacity. Um, but little thing that pops up here, bottle ready wine only. And this is what we struggle with. This is why we're here. So uh, the highly recommended and best practice, because some of you are probably sitting there and say, I don't have this pre-filter cartridge. I, I just have that one. Even my mobile bottle just has that one. And this is just, I'm trying to show you best, best practices. You know, some people ask, is a pre-filter cartridge on the bottling line really necessary? I have the other one. Why do I have to have that other one? This picture is kind of depicting it, right? This is. Um, uh, I kind of cut off by putting this in here, but this is the load of Saccharomyces cerevisiae on a pre-filter cartridge. So imagine if this hit your final membrane filter, it would have clogged pretty quickly. And um, they do really help to take the load off the final 0.45 micron membrane. Um, and they really help to give you higher throughput on that membrane. They're normally less expensive unless you're using a 0.65 micron membrane membrane, which is the same. Uh, material as this one. Um, and then some pre-filter medias on the market have adsorption and charge capabilities, and they, they are very good at smoothing over those associated colloids that tend to become frazzled, especially after cross-flow or uh, travel. Um, so just to give you an idea, if you overwhelm a membrane with 99.99% retention rating, which is some of them are 99.99, some of them is, are 99.98, uh, with a million colony forming units per mil. That is fancy for saying a million cells that can form their own families per milliliter. You still let through 100 cells per mil. So a uh, final membrane filter is a fantastic tool in you know, keeping microorganisms from getting into your bottle. But if you if you overwhelm them, you will get them through. It's not impossible. Uh, and that is that is the reason for pre-filtration. So if we look at this bottling line uh, case study that Bev tracked it, they're an uh, audit, auditing company that we recommend using. They're very good at counting cells and uh, identifying where on your where in your system are the troubles. So they they sampled the pre-filter housing interior. They found Saccharomyces and Candida. They, they sampled the final filter housing inlet hose. They found that and other species. And then final filter housing interior. So the the you know the before it goes through the final filter, they found even more Saccharomyces Candida, Picea, and Zygo Saccharomyces. And then horror above horror, final filter housing outlet hose, they found. Saccharomyces candida Picea, and Zygo again. The wines were filtered by a uh, 0.45 micron filter. They were cleaned, see, parentheses, cleaned, because you don't clean with hot water, but I don't want to get onto that bandwagon. 
I told myself, no, move on. <laughs> Lines um, were sanitized with uh, quaternary ammonia and they still found saccharomyces and zygote in the finished product. So th this, see, this happens to everyone. Um, I'm gonna come back to that slide and kind of show you what actually happened in that specific situation. But let's go through QC checks before, during, and after sterile filtration. And this is getting into the, a little bit of nitty gritty. This next slide is gonna be a lot of uh, print and I'm gonna kind of read through it because it is something that a winery should, or any production facility that, that's bottling for that case, write down your SOPs, make sure that they work for you. And then you, you have a little bit more control. Um, QC and QA, so quality control and quality assurance is something that, like I said, is a completely different presentation, uh, which I am not going to talk about. So the picture is pretty awesome because it this it's awesome in a bad way for the people that had to deal with it, but they you know did everything right before they wet the filters, they steam, sanitize the filters, and then they bottled. They didn't check, check integrity after the hot sanitization. And so they also didn't realize that there was a big air bubble trapped in those um, housings. And when they came to cool it down uh, with water, it shocked the living daylight out of the media and it caused subsequent turbulence, which led to this. So. The turbulence, the thermal warping is what they call it. Basically, you had these poor two little guys trying to sterile filter your wine and they were just letting all the things through. And the only way that you could have found out about this is if you did your integrity test after sanitization. So before you start, you're going to clean your bottling line and your housings without the filters in them. You're going to clean your floors, your drains. And just a little point that sanitizing is not cleaning. Uh, you can only sanitize a clean surface. You cannot sanitize a dirty surface. And then another little point is, here is you're not going to clean your bottling line in line with your housings. If, if you're running CIP through your housings, you're going to do that separately. You're not going to go uh, alkaline cleaner through your housings with the cartridges installed to your bottling line and loop it back to your filters because then your your filters are just filtering all the dirt you're putting on them and you're baking it in there and it's kind of sort of messy and it's the end of those filters as they were. Um, after cleaning everything, you're gonna wet the filters by running water through them uh, and then you're gonna hot water or steam sanitize with the filters installed and you're also going to do the same with the bottling line, and then you're going to cool it down. Then you're going to do your integrity test to make sure that that hot water sanitization or steam sanitization did not damage your media. Uh, on a single round, you're going to do a bubble point. On a multiple round, you're going to do a pressure diffusion because doing a bubble point on a multiple round is not very accurate because there can be some masking going on. And masking is basically if you test the bubble point of a single round and they say on the paperwork, oh, th this is 27.5 PSI is the minimum bubble point value. But when you test it, it, you only see that breach around 40 PSI maybe. So if you have multiple cartridges and there is actually one 10 inch segment with a hole in it, the total bubble point initially is so high that they might hide a hole in one of those 10 inch segments. So the most uh, uh, accurate way to test multiple round housings is pressure diffusion. If you are using stored membranes, inspect them, rinse them, uh, install and continue with step two and three. Uh, I would just say here, check those O-rings, uh, take them off when you, before you store them because they do tend to crack and stretch in things like ethanol and some of the storage solutions that we recommend. And then you're gonna ATP swab, this is a bioluminescent swab uh, that is useful to have just to confirm that there are no microorganisms uh, there. And then during uh, filtration and bottling, you're going to monitor differential line pressures and pressure spikes because yeast and bacteria are squishy and with enough pressure, you can push them through. Um, and if the bottling line goes down for more than 30 minutes because something happened 
uh, you're going to push out the wine, you're going to empty the filler bowl, you're going to repeat steps one, two, three above, because uh, that's enough time for things to get into your wine again. Um, afterwards, you're going to rinse that bottling line, you're going to rinse your filters, you're going to taste the integrity of the membranes to make sure they remained integral throughout the whole thing. Many times uh, you wouldn't do it because there wasn't any reason you didn't see that there were pressure spikes or anything, but it is best practice to just make sure they were good and you don't have to worry that that was a, a troublesome, potential troublesome part of what went wrong. Then you're going to QC your bottled uh, wines. You're going to confirm the free SO2, the dissolved oxygen. Are they good? Was there a reason that something went up um, in, during that uh, bottling? And then you would normally have some of these wines plated or PCR scorpion tested. If the wines were Velcro treated, you would plate. You wouldn't PCR scorpion test. Uh, this is this is what's done at all the big facilities or the bigger facilities for smaller wineries. You'd be like, after three months, they're fine. Let's just keep on selling it. Uh, you know, this is I'm just pointing out what is normally done if you have this regime going. And then you're going to clean your bottling line. Don't let the wine dry out on surfaces. Rinsing might not be enough for more viscous wines like the ones with sugar and the ones with so much mouthfeel, and um, to prevent biofilm buildup. So you're going to clean, you're going to clean again, you're going to just be cleaning all the time. So that, that's all I want to say about the QC checks. Anything over that, it is a very good idea to get a, a sanitation audit done. The things that you learn from that is crazy. Uh, now we're going to touch on turbidity versus filtrability and how you measure them and what they mean. So turbidity uh, is measured in nephilometric turbidity units or NTU. So sometimes we'll ask you, did, did you test the turbidity? How many, how much, you know, how many NTUs did it measure? And all that does is it basically tells us about the level of the presence of suspended solids. So this does not measure things that have gone into solution and don't show up necessarily with this, you know, scattered light. It's just a very basic way to tell how many suspended solids are hanging out in that wine. In many wineries, they say, oh, if your wine has an NTU of less than one, you won't clog your membranes, which is not true, because unfortunately, NTU does not tell us about the filtrability or the presence of colloids. If they're small enough, they won't show up. And you can have a beautifully bright wine under an NTU of one that will clog your filter so fast, you wouldn't even be able to get your coffee to watch the bottling line. So it's, it's pretty magic if you think about it. It's like an invisibility cloak. So it's useful, however, to measure NTU before and after a cellar depth filtration to confirm that that filtration was successful. Because the red flag is you go putting your wine through EK sheets or lenticulars and say, oh, you know what? It was so funny. It just flew through. There was no differential pressure. Yeah, that's, that's not good. You should see pressure on EK even if you're just filtering water. So Let's talk about this colloid, colloid situation. What on earth is a colloid? So there are two types of colloids found in wine, but we're going to talk about the macro, macromolecular colloids. Those are things like sugar, polysaccharides, proteins, manoproteins, carbo, I mean CMC, carboxymethylcellulose, pectin, and there are some other ones. And they can be good, you know, like manoproteins, they contribute to the mouthfeel. But colloids can present a problem for filtration uh, because it does something like here to the right. Glucans is just one, one type of uh, ugly colloid that likes to raise its ugly head. Not, normally not in the cellar, although a cross flow will let you know that something is not right. Uh, tighter filter sheets will maybe let you know something's not right. But if you're not watching for it, you normally find out about the presence of them when you're bottling. And the enzyme that it takes to break up these glucans is a six-week contact time. So I'm just pointing this one out because it's the outlier. But here is a picture of a clean polyether sulfur membrane surface, my, you know, electron microscope photo. And then here is what that uh, the beta glucans do. They're a fiber pr produced by certain 
bacteria, botrytis in the vineyard when it stresses, not when it's happily rotting away, but when it dries out, then it produces it. And then uh, pediococcus, some pediococcus species can also produce it during a rogue fermentation. So you can have fantastic grapes and still have this monstrosity happen. It just plugs everything up and stops it in its tracks. Um, so, so yeah, you know, it's, it's difficult to predict, uh, but if you have colloidal drama going on, you're not going to know about it with the naked eye. We can't see these things that they're just there. So it is a very good idea to keep the time between your final depth filtration, filtration so your cross flow or your tight sheet or your lenticular as short as possible because they like to come back and reconnect with each other and go into these long chains even if it's pectin or you know all of these lovely things that we that we um, add because we have to because we like to so you'll say but I add gum arabic or CMC or manoprotein and it says on the, on the packaging to wait 48 hours before bottling but then you say I have to go to bottling within 24 hours if I don't want to clog up my media so here is where it gets a little bit interesting because if you actually read the small print, they should put the small print big in my opinion and the normal instructions small so then you'll read it but it normally says to confirm bottle readiness with the filtrability test and that's vague as hell because filtrability is, hasn't really been standardized. There are a few different ways that it's been done but it's not it's not always accurate. The one that we like because it gives you the best snapshot is to measure filtrability index and then compare it to modified filtrability index. And you do it by running wine to this is 200 mil, 400 mil, 600 mil. So you this is a pressure vessel, you run it through, you measure, measure the time and this is a little 25 millimeter membrane disc of the same media that you're putting through on your bottling line, not a different manufacturer, not a different media, not a different porosity. I know it sounds so simple, but it is being done wrong all the time. And then you look at the, you extrapolate this because this is going to tell you how long it's going to go through your membrane. And um, this is just going to tell you, are you good or not? But like Dr. Paul Boyer says, he is, he is the authority on filtrability in our opinion. And he wrote this fantastic article that you can look up um, at, uh, on the internet and read it and it's a lot of small print but read it a few times for the penny to drop i had to i had to hear it many many times if that helps but sometimes filtrability index and modified filtrability index will be very close together then you know chances are i'm not going to clog my final filter this gamma arabic or cmc or manoprotein that i added has gone into solution but the problem is all the other colloids in your wine if you wait 48 hours, maybe the pectin or the sugar or the protein or the other things decided, ah, well, you just added this. Now we're going to change our solubility. So you, this is for this, but you don't know all the other colloids that are in there. And this test is really useful. And um, it takes time. You have to have it set up in your lab. It, it doesn't take that long, but it's still an extra step. You can't send off for this test because... The wine sample will shake all the way to the lab, in which time it has lost filtrability. And so it's not going to give you a very accurate uh, measurement. So basically what I'm saying is you can measure it or you can just become anecdotally extremely savvy and have a gut feel that you're going to plug when the mobile bottler arrives to tomorrow. What are we going to do, right? So let's talk about the timing of additions before bottling and how that affects filtrability. Oh, shoot, that's the wrong one. Mama mia. Wow. Okay, let's talk about colloidal drama. Colloidal drama is when you just added sugar and you just added that CMC and you just added all the things. And all these colloids flock to one another and go like, oh, new people, we want to meet you, we want to hang out with you. And then after a while, they start to go into solution and they're like, yeah, I've had enough of you people. I want to go home. You know, that's when they're good. That's when they're hanging out in short chains. They're not all bunched together like uh, a street party. 
that sounds so foreign now, the street party. But yeah, we want them to be good in short chain format so that they can go through the filter. And then when they're in the bottle, we don't really care. They can go dramatic, good, whatever. But we want to time our additions so that by the time we go to bottling, they're good, right? Normally, if you filter through a cross flow or any depth filter, the, the standard is to wait no longer than 48 hours. But sometimes, the, depending on what you're adding, we see filtrability fail within four hours, especially if you're adding a concentrate or a flavor or um, four hours, that doesn't give you much time. And then if you wait longer, you'll see it getting better and then getting worse. So nobody has time to watch that. We've got other things to do. So what we've found is the best way to not have to babysit the filtrability index and modif mo modified filtrability index is to run the wine through a cellulose-based depth filter in line with bottling. Um, you might have found this when using a mobile cross flow and then trying to schedule the mobile bottler to arrive and it's very rare that they arrive close to each other. So you, you definitely need to be prepared with an extra depth filtration step to take the wine and get them away from the street party and make them hang out, social distance right there. They can do the street party when they're back in the bottle, but they, you know, to get them in this format, putting them through a depth filter is the least expensive and the, the process with the least schlep. So to give you an idea, you can cross flow two wines into a tank, two separate tanks, and then bend them together and they will fail filtrability because you don't necessarily have to add stuff to the wine. You can add two wines together and they will fail. So sorry, if you thought you were going to get away with it, you will not. I want to just quickly reiterate this whole concept of dirt holding capacity. This is the picture of the membrane, very low dirt holding capacity, very precise. Um, this is more, this is the old slides that I used to use. See, you come in on one side, it keeps the stuff back and there you go. It, it doesn't quite, you know, do what I'm talking about. So for the sake of sheets, lenticular and pressure leaf, cross flow is a little bit different because it's tangential flow. but I wanted to see if, yeah, here it is. So surface filtration, depth filtration, and then adsorption. These are the three ways that a depth filter with dirt holding capacity does it. So you'll now you're gonna say, but I have this pre-filter cartridge on the bottling line. Why can't I just use that? Because it doesn't have as much dirt holding capacity. It does, it has some surface filtration. It has a little bit of depth filtration, but you can't say that pre-filter is five meters squared and your sheet is only 0.3 meters squared. So the pre-filter should have more depth. It doesn't, basically because it doesn't have a charge and charge is, is very interesting in that, that matrix of or tortuous path. So this is why if somebody says, we have a pre-filter cartridge as our main depth filter in the, in the winery, that's fine if you're only doing up to 100 gallon batches, but after that, it just lets the charge through because there's nothing to hold on to it. Um, and then I just wanted to say that cross flow can do funny things to the associated colloids and fail filtrability quickly because it's it's uh, kind of I think it's going through a tangential flow, so it's being sucked through these spaghettis, and it's it's kind of, it's very neat that the surface of the cross flow is constantly being cleaned, but those colloids get pretty frazzled when they have to go that route. Um, and so they, they need some smoothing over and the best way, if you're not measuring filtrability indexes, is to just have another depth filter in line with more clout. So I'm hoping, I was hoping this would work. I probably should have tried to. This is a video. Let's see. This is a video that you might have to rewatch. Maybe this could be homework. It's a very short video just to demonstrate how that works. But we did start a little late. So maybe we will we'll let you watch this one because normally this is supposed to come up. Maybe if I go. There it is. There it is. Voila. So. This is what we mean by dirt holding capacity. So cellulose-based 
there might be some tiny amount of diatomaceous earth and perlite. Uh, it's pretty cool how they did this. Direct interception is a fancy word for surface filtration. So the removal occurs when particles are larger than the filter media pore size or flow path channels and they get trapped. So then we're going to do depth filtration. The fancy word is inertial impaction. Oh, those Germans, they're so good with their fancy words. <laughs> but so due to the momentum, particles leave the fluid flow path and collide with filter fibers where they become trapped. Okay, so this is a big part of dirt holding capacity. And then the third one is adsorption. So this is the charge. Contaminants which carry a negative charge are attracted and retained by opposite charged filter media. Depending on the grade, some, some contaminants are actually positively charged and they get it retained by negatively charged diatomaceous earth. So I thought that was um, just to give you a little more than a simple graphic. We're going to go to the next one, and that is really the options for adjusting filtrability in line with bottling. Um, the, my favorite one is lenticular filtration because it is a closed system. It doesn't take up a lot of space. There's a bunch of advantages, advantages to it, and you'll be like, but we're a big winery. We don't have, uh, we can't do so slow because this is a little 12-inch three high housing. You get lenticular filters all the way up to 48 meters squared of surface area and they run at 120 gallons a minute and it's pretty impressive because this is what some of the big people are doing and they're seeing you know just post cross flow adjusting filtrability they're getting two to three million gallons throughput before changing out the media this thing pays for itself within the first six months um the second one my not so favorite one is sheet filtration but if that's all you have then don't throw it away, use it. Unfortunately, you know, you if you've set up a sheet filter, you know it's a long setup and breakdown time. It's not as sanitary, especially if you've not taken those plates out and cleaned them uh, a lot. Uh, bypass is a lot more likely if you put this in line with bottling. Filtering from tank to tank is totally fine, but putting them in line with bottling, that stopping and starting, that peristaltic action, not so perfect and your DO pickup is definitely going to be larger. Um, and then pre-filter cartridges, they should be used regardless of lenticular or sheet. This is not in place of fixing. This should just sit in front of your, your membrane because re remember, they don't have enough dirt holding capacity to adjust filtrability for bigger runs. Um, membrane storage and management. So this picture is at a winery that uses 12 uh, 12 round cartridge housing. So on this side of the cart is six canisters. It's basically just PVC pipe that they're capped on the one side. And then there's a loose cap that they can do on the second side. And I think there's some cling wrap that they sometimes put over the top. Um, but yeah, you take the cartridge out of the housing, you remove the O-rings for use later on, you put them in here. And those that were, in this case, they were all filled with um, a sulfur. Uh, acidified sulfur solution. They did have ethanol, but that's kind of a lot of ethanol. And some of the people at that winery did enjoy vodka tonics that were colored with red wine. So they decided to switch from the ethanol because it kept on disappearing. Would you blame them? I mean, it's a great idea to switch it out. Wine flavored vodka tonics. <laughs> so this is kind of what that looks like. Uh, I'm, th and this is the most boring slide of them all. Um, use new filters for the start of bottling season. It's a good idea to start fresh. You can either purchase your own or, depending on how your relationship with your mobile bottler is, purchase through them. They, you know, th this is between y'all, like Megan would say. So record the differential pressure progressions and volume throughput. And I know this is difficult because you, during bottling, you're doing all these other things. You're trying to put the right one in the right bottle with the right label, the right capsule. And there's a lot, there's a lot going on there. But this will give you a very good snapshot of what's going on down the line. And if you want to keep your filters to reuse, only do that if the differential pressure came down after you regenerated them. But store them properly because we don't want... You know, one cell, if you store these cartridges just in water overnight and there's one yeast cell in there, 
it will turn into a trillion overnight in the right conditions because remember there's now also some other things in that filter even if you even if you sanitize it that's there's still baked dirt in there that that yeast can use to multiply in so storage storage is very important we have a link on our website which is also very wordy on the new web website it will look better hopefully coming soon to a website near you and um, if you're using your mobile bottlers filters and they tell you, well, we just use um, one set for all the wineries this year and then we don't have to pay all that money. Well, the issue is, if it was me, I would want a new set and I would want to keep that set because if the wine was filtered at the winery down the street and they kept it in there, now I want to know what was the, what wines did they filter? Um, what was the micro load that that filter faced? How was the filter stored between uses? And was the housing cleaned and sanitized without the filters installed first? Because if you have now all this bioform built up, uh, that filter is gonna do its best to retain 10 to the power of seven, but if there's a million cells, it's letting a hundred of them through per mole. So I would want to start clean and I'm pretty sure most mobile bottles wouldn't want to take that chance. Um, there are too many variables that can cause cross contamination and you you have to ask yourself is it worth the risk maybe you're the gambling type and then you if it feels good do it you know if it doesn't work out then maybe that is a place where it could have gone wrong finally general bottling line sanitation guidelines and this is kind of it it's like i want to say the filter is doing its job when it's plugging up you know, it's letting you know, and I'm, I have a little summary after this, so don't, don't be afraid that this is the end of it, but look at all these other common sites and areas for microbial contamination on a packaging line. Um, it's not only about the filter, unfortunately. Getting the filter part right is very, very important, but there are some other things. Look at this picture. This was a water filter housing at a winery that was getting hits on their bottling line. Of course, what do you do when you get hits on the bottling line? You blame the filter. But in this case, it was a filter that they hadn't changed out in a very long time, and it was a water filter. And look at all this biofilm buildup everywhere. It, it was just contaminating everything that they rinsed. Um, here is a, a, a housing. To, here is a thing that we say uh, dead legs. What is a dead leg? So I, I assume with this filter, it comes in this way. Then it goes through the filter, or no, it comes in this way. It goes through the filter, it goes out through here and then out through there, right? So this is a dead leg. This housing is not always going to be full. And this is unsanitary uh, valves, they're, uh, they're threaded. So this is a, a big place where microorganisms can be uh, gathering and multiplying and happily living ever after in your wine. What a great place to be, right? This is a dead leg. Um, identifying these things in your winery and seeing, you know, why are they there? Maybe if you had a housing that just went, you know, did not allow for that, that would already make a big difference. But you see all these things, the outlet from the buffer tank to the surge tank, because this is also for people that are canning and uh, carbonating um, but wait there's more also the inlet and outlet to heat exchanges and carbonators the, up, the I think in this previous one the the pumps and valves upstream of your filtration system you know is your pump sanitary and if not so are you opening it up and cleaning it like a lot uh, valves corker this vacuum line hose this has been a very big source of contamination if you're your uh, air, the air that goes into your uh, sterile gas, wherever you're using sterile gas, it should be sterile filtered. This is all things that we've seen from audits where um, it's been the source of contamination. And it's upsetting to think that there are all these variables and things that we have to watch. The water source at the packaging line is a very big thing because water quality is going to continue to be something that we need to control. Atmosphere in packaging areas, <laughs> not like are people mad working there, not that kind of atmosphere, but how humid is it? How does it smell? How does it, you know, are you 
are you making uh, wine and fermenting in the same room that you're bottling in? Because then you're probably just getting yeast from the air and it's going straight into your open can if you're canning. And um, I just wanted to briefly touch on, and I know that we're, we're getting there, but just biofilms, because we get this question a lot. So how could there be biofilms if you see steam sanitize your bottling lines? Certainly you steamed at this very high temperature for over half an hour. The thing is, it's just because something looks visibly clean, it doesn't mean that it is clean or sanitized. Biofilms can be invisible to the naked eye. And so what happens is they attach themselves to the surface. They then immediately cover themselves with this protective glue, which is polysaccharides, and it's very amazing. If you think about survival, and, and then they disperse. And this growth and this covering with um, this polysaccharide material can withstand steam sanitization. That is the scary thing. And if you ran caustic over it, you burnt it into place. Then you even strengthened the little, uh, you strengthened that, you strengthened that bond. And now they're so well insulated that uh, they're not, steam is not going to kill them. And then here comes the beautiful wine and they start dispersing into your wine. This is, this is survival right there. This is amazing, but not for us, for them. So they've adapted and figured out how to get by this situation. Um, and just, I looked at it this morning because I'm like, how can I make it a little bit more practical? Think about a shower. Uh, you, can, you can rinse it off with hot water. You can do anything. But if you don't actually get in there and scrub it, that stuff's just going to stay there and they're just going to grow. And uh, actually, uh, um, the microorganism that they use to do the challenge test is one of those same ones that grows in the shower that makes that little, cr that pinkness. It's very crazy, ironic, actually. So I promised you that we'd go back over this, the bottling line bed track case study. They found all the stuff everywhere. What actually happened here is it wasn't the fact that the filter was the wrong retention or it wasn't had didn't have good retention it wasn't how the filter was treated they checked all of this out it wasn't about the microbes they were this is kind of everything was right the pre-bottling treatments was right the colloids were taken care of what it actually happened is this winery made a big so2 ad right before bottling and they found um in this specific case study that it was uh retinomyces and it had shrunk the cells by 22 percent and that's a lot and there's a little sentence here that I think I took out because I didn't want to oh no I didn't it's to enter it was viable but non-culturable state so you added the SO2 it shocked this uh, these microorganisms into like if you've ever smelled SO2 you would know how they feel like right they shocked the living daylights out of them and they went all shrinky and small, they're still viable, but if you had plated them out, they wouldn't have grown. So you wouldn't actually be able to prove that they were there. Case um, in point is do not make big, big SO2 ads right before you go to bottling. You can make small ones, um, but I think this was above like 15 parts per million uh, ad. Be careful when you do that. You can look at la lactic acid bacteria. If you shrink something that's 0.45 micron by 22%, it's going to go through your 0.45 micron sterile filter all day long. And I just want to add to this, using a 0.2 micron membrane is not going to solve your problems because you still have to clean between the filter and the filler. So some finer points in summary regarding filtration. Sterile filtration, it's a very good to add a pre-filtration step to ensure a longer lifespan of your final filters. Inert gases used on the packaging line should be sterile filtered and filters should be changed out on a schedule if you're not autoclaving these air filters. Nobody has an autoclave that I know of, so you have to change, remember to change them out. Water used on the bottling line should be filtered. Water filter housing should be cleaned on a schedule, media changed out regularly. If your final or pre-filter cartridges clog, 
actually here by number three, a winemaker called me the other day and he said, I had no idea how big an effect the water had. Now that I'm filtering my water before I rinse my filters, my throughput has quadrupled and I could see it in his purchase history. He now buys three filters a year instead of 36. So he had that going for him. Number four, if your final pre-filter cartridge is clogged, that is a good thing. It means they're trying to not let microorganisms through, but it points to potential areas to improve upon. Maybe we have to look at those colloids moving forward. Was your cellar depth filtration done right? Um, did you test the NTU before and after to rule out bypass? Do you understand filtrability index and modified index and how that can be a useful tool? You have to go do the homework and read that article and then we can talk about that. And how did you long how long did you wait before bottling after your depth filtration step that makes a big difference? Did you add anything to upset the colloidal balance in the meantime? Did the owner of the winery say, you know what, I'm gonna add another bit of tannin, sprinkle some sugar in there? They'll never know. Next morning you come in, you're like, What? What happened? <laughs> this has happened where I work. Did you store the bottling cartridges properly between uses or did you grow an ecosystem of microorganisms overnight? Because if you leave them overnight in water, that is what will happen. And then, the, see, this is a cute little biofilm situation with very nice goo all over it. Um, sanitation. Um, clean and sanitize means clean. Sanitize without cleaning is not clean or biofilm free. Hot water, steam, and or chemical sanitation steps. So some people tell me, I don't have hot water or steam. Can I just run a, san run a sanitizer through there? And it's like, sure. Did you clean it before though? Because these are great, but if you don't clean it before, then it doesn't make sense at all. Uh, the ATP bioluminescent swabbing is a good tool to uh, confirm the presence of microorganisms before packaging. They just tell you, there is something living here on the surface. Uh, and then maintenance cleaning schedule on packaging line, that's the one I'm not touching on, that's completely different. Um, presence of unsanitary valves and fittings, like how, when was the last time you took apart bull valves and looked at all the lovely things growing in there, for example. Um, same with your filler heads. Filler heads should be taken apart periodically and cleaned in depth. Um, identify the entrapment zones and those dead legs. Post-packaging QC of product confirms sterility because you don't want a recall. If you're big enough to be, uh, you know, in a place that can throw your product out, out, that is irreparable, expensive. It is reparable, but it is expensive. Measuring dissolved oxygen levels and keeping them to a minimum throughout the process to minimize oxidation and discourage microbial growth. I'm also keeping SO2 more uh, effective. And this is especially a big thing during the canning process. The packaging location, it should be done in a separate room or building where the air is filtered and free of airborne yeast and bacteria. Um, periodic third party QC audits is an excellent way to continuously uh, improve. And you shouldn't take it personally when they tell you, oh, we found like millions of psychosaccharomyces. It's great when they find it because then you can get rid of it. It's not personal, uh, it's, it's a way to be very good at what you do and, and paying somebody to tell you. <laughs> it's not as expensive as you might think. And then adding a second kill step as insurance, like a beverage sterilant in, in other industries that pasteurize, we don't do that, we have other ways. And that is basically, I think we have some time for questions and if you want to revisit uh, slide we can do that but yeah I didn't want to keep it too long because it is a lot of information so thanks for your time span thanks Maria that was um <laughs> super informative yes um uh, it, it really washes over you how many things there are to uh keep an eye on during this process um we obviously we have time for questions um people are welcome to type their questions into the chat um, or if it's easier, you're also welcome to just uh, unmute yourself um, and and uh, ask that way. Um, we, we do already have a question in the chat, so I'm going to go right to that. Um, we have a question. What can cause a lack of differential pressure during filtering? A very good question. Hi, Denise. It is 
it can be a few things. And if you if you have a pressure build up, right? So we call it a progression. So you will start running at five to seven psi. So your inlet is five psi, your outlet is zero. Or if you're running a sparkling product and your inlet pressure is 40 psi and your outlet pressure is 35 psi, then you're going to watch that inlet pressure minus the outlet pressure. So first of all, it's important to know what you're looking at. So if you say the pressure drops, always look at the difference between the inlet and the outlet. If it drops, so if you're if you're seeing that this is a, a depth media like lenticular or sheets, and you see, wow, we built up to to like 12 psi, and suddenly it drops down to something else. That could be a, a, a indication of bypass. It could also be an indication that the charge on that media was spent. So you have something so colloidally dramatic, so strongly charged. That, that adsorption capability of that media was spent. And really what you have to do there, and you'll if you measure the NTU before and after, you'll see the NTU level go up. Uh, it's pretty alarming. It's a, it's a very complex, uh, it's a very good question. It's a complex answer because it can also be spikes. If it's on the bottling line and you see, oh, my filter isn't, what happened to the bottling filter? That can be that it was blown out. Um, so it's it it just depends on the on the the application. So it's it's a very good question. I can talk about it for another hour, but not time. <laughs> yeah, great great question. That's uh, yeah. Um, we have another great question um, in the chat um, from um, Tom Payette. I've seen a large range of caustic solution rates used to rejuvenate a filter. What might you recommend as a good caustic dilution solution ratio, or do you recommend something other than caustic? It's an um, excellent question, and I agree with you. When I started at Scott Labs, um, I think their recommendation was a 5% caustic solution to soak your final filter membrane in. And I was like, holy mother, who makes a 5% caustic solution and doesn't burn the hell out of something? You know, because it's like, wow, that is very alkaline and then you don't take off your o-rings and your filter is fine but your because the pes membrane and the polypropylene pre-filter can handle a ph of 1 to 14 no problem some of the other medias are very sensitive but i was like what and then they changed it to two percent and then they changed it to one percent and then i learned from our my staff microbiologist and nicola hall who is brilliant she said oh but did you know that caustic is a terrible cleaner and that it has such a high surface tension because it it holds onto the dirt and then uh, very poorly and then it just drops it right next to where it picked it up so it's actually burning on the dirt so we and th this presentation is not about selling our product but what um really works for these uh membranes if it's pes or polypropylene not the cellulose acetate not the uh glass fiber, some of those more sensitive ones, is Distainix. And I know you know Distainix because it's been around for a while. It was designed for wineries. It's much more gentle. And if you go on our technical library, you'll see there's a cleaning brochure and it shows you how to use it. And it's a lot gentler. It's much better for the environment. I use it in my house uh, because that's what I do now, <laughs> cleaning grout and stuff. But it's never been an issue of... Um, oh, wow, I got caustic in my eye, I'm going to die. Uh, it just, if you want to clean with caustic and you're like, I'm not buying the stainix, I'm sticking with my guns, then add a surfactant, uh, an oxidizer to that caustic. So if you're going to use one or 2% of caustic, add 0.5% of hydrogen peroxide and not in the form of peracetic acid, food grade hydrogen peroxide that you and um, you can get, and that will help the caustic lift the dirt out. Um, it's messy. The Stanix is the low foaming one is still my favorite thing. So there you have it. I sold something on Scott Labs. Naughty, naughty. <laughs> oh, awesome. That was um, another, yeah, uh, great, great answer. Um, great question. I mean, yeah, great question. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see, uh, other 
questions. I'm gonna I'm going to wait a second and see if anybody unmutes or types anything. And you can email me. There's my email address. And uh, if I don't know it, I I have other people around me that's much smarter. So it's great. We're surrounded by information. It's lovely to dish it out. Um, I I'm going to go ahead then and ask a question myself. Um, yeah. You um, during the presentation, and maybe I, I um, misheard again. It was like a ton of great content. Um, you were talking about checking O-rings before storing um, the cartridges. Um, is this something that you 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 recommend? Uh, you know, checking them. Um, and I thought you said something about uh, being careful what you store them in. Or is that something where you really? Um, generally recommend that people replace the o-rings every year right so if we're talking about cartridge filters that those o-rings should last for the lifespan of the cartridge but if you're going to store it in a solution that's low ph or even just uh, ethanol like you know cheap vodka uh, it's a very good idea to just take them off and all you and i now of course i do have a cartridge in this corner i can show you you basically just stretch it around you don't come in there with a knife and try to wedge it off because then you're just going to cut the living daylight out of it you just stretch it with your fingers and then you lift it off and you store them just hanging dry um on your there where you store your fittings on that board and and then you you know because what happens is if you store them in ethanol or these weird things they sometimes stretch and then they're not going to give you a good feel when you replace them back and put the cartridges in the housing and you're going to fail your integrity test. Um, and you're going to be like, what the hell? And it wasn't the cartridge, it was the gasket, those O-rings. So you can store them, you can harvest O-rings from cartridges that you've already had uh, before you get rid of them. Um, it's just a nice thing to have on hand. But as soon as you see any kind of hardening or cracking or stretching, get rid of them. Um, it's just one of those little things. Uh, you don't want to make O-ring soup in your storage solution. Uh, the same with lenticular modules. Actually, you know, the SuperDisc 2s have the flat gasket, have this, sometimes it's blue, sometimes it's white, depending on which size. And that's not actually something we can order <laughs> from the manufacturer. They're like, what? You didn't, you didn't, you, well, the germ, the, the guy that we deal with at the size factory is absolutely brilliant and the manager for the Supra product around the world. And he's like, why on earth would you want to order that as an extra? Don't you know that you take them out between uses and when you store them? I'm like, no, I didn't. Because they're silicone. The ones that we get is food grade silicone. You can, of course, get them in Viton and EPDM and all kinds of crazy things for filtering. I don't know what they filter, like methanol, cr crazy stuff. Um, and he's like, no, I will not send you those parts. I will make a point to say that you're not allowed to order this. And I was like, that is so crazy. So those are definitely ones you want to keep. If you're using the super disc to keep them because I cannot get them for you, even if we ask nicely. <laughs> well, very practical tip. That is uh, really, um, there's science behind yeah. it, also just a sheer like um, practicality and cost savings type uh, uh, component of that answer there. Thank you. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, let's see, uh, do we have any, any other questions for Maria today? It's, it's going to take a minute for this stuff to wash over you, you know, and let it kind of, I don't want to say fest it, I want to say cement cleanly. <laughs> And then you'll be like, but why? Why? And 10 minutes later, right, you'll be like, damn it, I should have asked this. This is how it works with me. <laughs> and if you do, uh, um, you know, uh, Maria has kindly uh, included her um, email address here. You're also, of course, always welcome um, to reach out to me. I realized, by the way, I didn't, I don't think I introduced myself. So for anybody on the call yeah. who didn't know who I was, um, I'm Beth Chang. I'm the Enology Extension Specialist at Virginia Tech. So, um, uh, but I figured you've been getting emails from me and you 
probably got the drift of who I am. Um, anyway, um, and uh, so you're also welcome to email me. It's um, E as in Elizabeth, abc at bt.edu. Um, and I can also always pass those on to Maria. Um, and then uh, just a reminder that, um, you know, this was recorded. It will be posted to um, BT Analogies blog so that you can access it if you'd, you know, like to review that content after it kind of ferments in your brain a little bit. Um, and then the other thing is, again, that a survey will be going out um, immediately, you know, within about 20 minutes. And just, it's really quick. If you can just click click through, it would be super helpful for us for um, assessing this program and future programming um, on these topics. So yeah. Okay, I don't see any more. So I'm just going to go ahead and um, I will I will clap this way. You, uh, and thank Maria very, very thank much you. for thank her time you for having and me. for Megan and Scott Labs for um, co hosting this event with us. So thank you. Awesome. Megan, did you have anything else to add, by the way? I didn't know if you. Yeah. OK, all right. Thank you very much, Beth and Maria. Thank you, Beth. Thanks, Megan. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Take care, <laughs> Bye. Bye.